Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So today's session is with respect to the specific history and examination, which I may have said in one of the videos earlier, that um, uh, we will do videos pertaining to particular neurological disorders. So what we're going to discuss today is Parkinson disease. It's uh, also called in Urdu Rasha ki bimari. And it is a commonly seen disorder, very mismanaged by different physicians, and uh, probably not easily diagnosed by the people who haven't seen these patients before. So I'm going to give a brief overview for medical students and residents to recognize the symptoms so they can refer these patients appropriately to neurophysician or for general practitioners because they will be the ones who will be seeing more of these patients, especially in the early stage of the disease. So let's start with Parkinson's disease history and examination. So in neurology and neurological disorders, history is a key component. Based on that foundation, you do your examination and clarify what is it exactly. There are different types of Parkinson's disease. So it's easy to say this patient has Parkinsonism, which means patient has Parkinsonian features. But to tell that is it a typical Parkinson disease, it is an atypical Parkinson disease, or is it a Parkinson disease associated with some other uh, medical disorder like strokes? Because stroke, especially small lacunar strokes in pertinent areas of the brain, can give what we call vascular Parkinson disease. So let's start with the history first. So in these patients, many a time, the early manifestation noticed by the family, not particularly by the patient, is the jerking or the tremor of the hand. Okay, sometimes it's scary, what's going on, but most commonly it's the tremor between thumb and index finger. So it's kind of a thumb pill rolling tremor, but it could be a tremor involving the metacarpophalangeal joint or wrist joint. So the tremor may be the early manifestation. So that is something what we call tremor predominant Parkinson disease. And naturally, we we not gonna discuss the treatment in this video session. So the tremors are usually early manifestation. The other thing which may be earlier than tremor, because it is usually unnoticed by the family or the patient, is that the patient is progressively getting slower. So what they are able to do in the past at a much faster pace is what they are not able to do as fast now. They sometimes attribute that to aging, to stress, or the burden of the job, but they are progressively slowing down, which is usually noticed by the family. If it's a female at home, she's having difficulty with doing the household chores, so it becomes harder to complete or she's dropping things, or that may be the reason she come to attention. The other big manifestation these patients have, and that is usually not recognized even by the physicians, is falls. That the patients have frequent fall, they keep on falling. It may be a particular variant of Parkinson's disease, but falls are commonly seen in Parkinsonian patients for unclear reason. So whenever a patient comes in with falls, we always need to confirm what's the reason behind it. Was there any loss of consciousness? If there was no loss of consciousness, we have to look for Parkinsonian features. The next big one is psychosis, which means agitation, behavioral changes. And these patients are, if they have mood issues in the past, it may get aggravated, or they start having delusions and hallucinations which is they have ideas that some people are visiting them when actually patient's family hasn't noted those people. Or they are seeing insects or animals, or they have come up with some weird idea that someone is plotting against them. Okay. Sleep is another symptom these patients may have, and it may be unnoticed even sometime if the neurophysician may not ask. And the common one is insomnia or hypersomnia. So they either sleep less or they sleep more. And it has been noticed that in Parkinsonian or Parkinson disease patients, sometimes RAM sleep behavioral disorder, which is RBD, may present many years earlier 
So sometimes it is very helpful to get the sleep study on these patients. And those are abnormal uh, shouting movements, especially in the later half of the night. It's not the early usually, it's the later half of the night. So sometime around 2, 3 p.m. a.m., they start acting up and they start making noises and acting up in the dream. And spouse would be the first person to notice those symptoms. Neuropsychiatric symptoms are also very common and under-recognized, especially depression. So 40% of Parkinsonian patients have depression at some point during the disease. So it really need to be discussed during the clinical session with them and to address it early on to improve the quality of life. Cognitive issues, especially memory issues, or uh, they, they start having uh, problems with the family. It may be behavioral, as we just discussed in the psychosis or neuropsychiatric symptoms. But additionally, they start having memory issues. There are different ways to assess it. What type, because there's a, another variant, our Parkinson disease, where the memory issues comes in first. Then next is cognitive, after cognitive is autonomic, which is actually my super subspecialty. So in autonomic dysfunction, these patients with Parkinson disease are having central autonomic dysfunction. And it is commonly seen in a variant called Schreier-Dreger syndrome, where there could be orthostasis, there could be bladder dysfunction. These patients start complaining difficulty with the swallowing, with constipation, early on and it is actually Parkinsonian manifestation so we need to tell the family and the patient that it is related with the Parkinson disease not something else these patients sometimes have subjective sensory symptoms but usually there are no objective sensory abnormality other symptoms these patients may complain could be pain restless leg syndrome those could be the additional symptoms, especially back it can be seen in these patients. So in a patient who come into clinic for evaluation and we suspect Parkinson's disease, all these points need to be touched to get a good detail of where we are as a baseline. When it comes to examination, during the clinical session, we can assess the patient if they are having reduced spontaneous body movements. And the most common thing to observe is the blink rate or the facial expression. So sometimes they are called having a mask-like face, but what I see more commonly is the blink rate, which gives me the idea, is it a patient on the Parkinson side or is something else going on? Because there could be something what we call psychosomatic slowing, where there are no Parkinsonian features, but they are slow. So I think the blink rate in those particular cases helps. Orthostasis is to assess for the autonomic dysfunction, so we can objectively check blood pressure in laying position after five minutes and on standing up right away and after three minutes. And that will give us the idea, yes, it's crude, it's not very sensitive, but still it gives us the idea in the clinical setting that is there an autonomic dysfunction or not. Additionally, there could be more fine autonomic function testing which can be done I think the screening could be just an ECG, which gives you the idea if there is a sinus arrhythmia is present or not. But there are other sensitive testing which can be done for autonomic dysfunction. Olfactory testing, which is not routinely done in neuro examination, should be done in patients with dementia and Parkinson's disease because patients with particular type of dementia and Parkinson's disease have early loss of smell. So that could be another clue that can give you the idea that this patient have Parkinson's disease or not, or some other neurodegenerative condition. Vertical gaze assessment. If we are suspecting this patient is having Parkinson's disease, there is a variant of Parkinson's disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. In that case, patient particularly have vertical eye gaze abnormality, and it's really restricted. And they have frequent falls. So that can help us define because then we can prognosticate these patients for the patient and for the family to guide them about the management and what to expect. Additional, all the patients for Parkinson's disease, we should assess the tone and see if there's an asymmetry because in the typical Parkinson's disease, there is asymmetry and one side is usually more involved compared to the other side. 
But if there is a symmetrically increased tone, there is possibility it is atypical Parkinson's disease and the prognosis is different in those cases. We should look for the pyramidal signs, especially upgoing planters, hyperreflexia on one side. That will give us the idea if there is possibility of vascular Parkinson's disease or if there is corticobasal degeneration. Again, sensory assessment can be done to rule out other abnormalities, but commonly there is no objective sensory abnormality in Parkinson's disease patients. Cerebellar assessment should be done because patients with multi-system atrophy with the cerebellar manifestation could be the ones uh, fitting into that particular category of Parkinson's disease. So tendon gait, finger nose, finger testing can be done in these patients. What I usually tell to my junior doctors or residents or students that you initially do a good history and based on that history, you kind of define or revise your examination. There is a separate video for the screening neurological examination, but then you can do specific neurological examination based on what you're suspecting. I hope this video will be helpful for the general practitioner and junior doctors. Thank you very much.